everybody. We are continuing a conversation with Paula J. Kaplan. She is an author, she is a psychologist, she's also a playwright, and we spoke to her about her book this last week, if you saw the show, and if you didn't, turn on demand and catch it. But we talked to her about her new book, which is When Johnny and Jane Come Marching Home. It is a book about our veterans and what we really can do to help the veterans who come home from our wars. She's passionate about this particular cause, which is one of the reasons we're continuing the conversation. We spoke about the problems the last time, but we did not speak about a cure. I am going to read you something about this book that was written. I have to put on my glasses. It says here, this is a work of profound and astonishing humanity. A distinguished champion of public health, Paula Kaplan shows that emotional trauma is often the normal and healthy response of soldiers to the brutalities of warfare. So what we, uh, so what we need is not a narrow redefinition of the soldier's experience as a medical syndrome, but rather an honest social healing process that treats the soldier with dignity and respect and is a harbinger of hope for all of society. Remember all that because we're coming right back to you with Paula and some ideas of how you can help. So please stay tuned. But first, I want to say that this segment of Conversations with Gloria Greer is brought to you by the Camelot Theaters at 2300 Barista Road in Palm Springs. And of course, these theaters bring us the finest in film fair from around the world, independent gems that delve into the arts, documentaries, and award-winning and nominated motion pictures. In addition to the outstanding film seen at the Camelot, there's always good food in the Camelot Cafe, as well as delicious cocktails and appetizers upstairs in the picturesque Cine Bar. So please remember that the Camelot is the place to go. Okay, now back to you, Paula, and back to our very serious subject. Um, it's amazing what various psychologists, you know, I read what was said, but I didn't say who's before. If you turned on late, you missed it. <laughs> but it was a quote from Jamin Raskin, professor of law at the American University and a Maryland state senator. You know, we talked about um, the trauma that, that our veterans are going through. And we talked about your father and that he was in World War II. Yeah. And, and he seldom spoke about any personal problem, but you once got him to speak about something. Yes, the one time he looked upset when yeah. it was just about something he had been through was he said he saw, uh, this was in, in uh, World War II, he saw a dead body mm -hmm. face down and he said the person's back had exploded and, and he teared up and he choked up and then he said you couldn't tell if it was American or German and it, and it was clear that it didn't matter, it was just seeing human life destroyed was yeah. just shook him to the core yeah. and so I, I, this this part of the interview um, is really the one with hope and and it gives people something that they can do everybody can do absolutely every citizen you mean this part of this interview on conversations yes. with Gloria Greer that's right, right. Now. that's right yeah because we talked about the problems and the fact that there's too much medication yeah and, you know, before we were on the air, I was saying, I remember when psychiatrists would just listen. Yes. And today it's take the drugs. Well, it hardly ever happens anymore, and it's partly um, that they're understaffed at the VA. Uh, a doctor from the VA told me last week that if you're in the mental health system at the VA, the average frequency with which you're seen by a professional is once every three months. Now, that's not listening. That's a medication check. And you know what? I want to say this really clearly. If there were enough good therapists so that they were helping a lot, enough yeah. veterans, or if the medication was helping a lot, then I would say whatever helps reduce the pain, then I am all for it. And so I'm not even saying people shouldn't try those things. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that there is a risk-free 
way, and it's a very inexpensive, in fact, it's, it's, it's a cost-free way of actually helping vets. And I know this because it's what the veterans themselves told me, veterans from all wars. How many, how many interviews have you done with veterans? Oh, hundreds now. I mean, because I, I started out, I wrote the book, I've been doing more, more of them write to me now when they hear about the book or they hear that it's out now or they hear interviews, and so I've, I've lost count. I must say that you have a website. Yes. And the website, maybe we can get up on the screen, because you'd like veterans to write you yes. so that you would have their experiences. Yes, and they can attach their name, their email address, or they can do it anonymously. And let me let me tell you why. Maybe, should I say the sure. website first? Um, well, it's, it's, been, it's on the screen Oh, right it's on now. the screen. Right under okay. your picture All right. that's being televised. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's, here's, the, here's the rationale behind it, but behind doing these interviews. Every civilian should listen to a veteran's story. It's what veterans have said is helpful to them. And, and here's why. Because fewer than 1% of Americans have ever even been in the military. So we are a nation that is war illiterate. Most of us really haven't a clue about what war is really like. We may think we know bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And most people just kind of tune out when they hear about war. Who wants to hear about it? Well, the vets come home. They are isolated. They may talk to other vets, they may talk to one other person, maybe in their family, but they mostly don't talk to anybody else because they're afraid we'll think they're crazy. A lot of the times they think they're crazy because they're so anguished and they think, I'm supposed to be over this by now. What's wrong with me that I can't sleep at night and that sort of thing. Um, they're afraid to talk to us because they're afraid we won't understand because we weren't there and they're afraid to talk to us because they're afraid we will be as upset as they were. And then civilians, on the other hand, we often hold back from vets and we don't tend to ask them, do you want to talk? Because most civilians who are not therapists believe they don't know what to do. Yeah. What right. if I say the wrong thing? I won't know the right questions to ask because I'm not a therapist. And I'm telling you, there isn't a lot that has been definitely proven in psychological research, but one of the things that has been is that whatever you are suffering, isolation will make it worse. And whatever you are going through, it's almost always the case that, well, they call it social support or a support network, but it's human connection. It's, we used to call it friendship. Mm -hmm. That is what helps you heal. And veterans have said to me over and over, veterans from all wars have said to me, when that person asked me if I wanted to tell my story, and I told my story that night, I got a good night's sleep for the first time since Iraq or since Vietnam, some of them said. Amazing. So it's really easy to do. It costs nothing. So we're starting a national project. I want every civilian out there to interview a vet. And, and it's, chapter six is all about it, but it's, it, it's very simple what you do. Whatever your politics are and whatever the vet's politics are, totally irrelevant. Because what you do is you say to the vet, as an American whose country sent, whose government sent you to war, I take some responsibility for listening to what you went through over there and listening to how it's been since you've come home and I am not here to judge. Now, I guarantee you, the vast majority of the time, you won't even have to ask another thing. Your job is to listen and listen with all your heart and really pay complete attention. The one thing I really urge people to look for a chance to say is when they've described something awful that happened to them, if you can take the opportunity to say, I know that if I had been through what you just told me that you went through, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I would feel anguished. I would feel this moral conflict. I don't think you're crazy and I don't think you're mentally ill. Vets have told me that somebody saying that it just makes all the difference. And even the ones Amazing. who were helped by therapists have said, yeah. yeah, but they get paid. And you know what? I don't live in their office. I live out here. So when somebody from the community reaches out, listens with compassion, it makes an enormous difference. Can I just tell you uh, really quickly? Yeah. Okay, there's a, um, there's a man out here in Palm Desert named Dave Jones, mm -hmm. who's a Vietnam vet, and he has written a book of exquisite poetry. It, it's called A Soldier's Story, The Power of Words. 
and I quote his poetry all through the book because he says it better than I could. This is, this is the last part of a poem that he writes about how it feels when somebody listens to your story. And it goes like this, directions I do not provide. You only need a heart. And if you understand a vet, you've made a small, small start. That's so simple. So simple and, and so, so beautiful. To the point. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the use of drugs, uh, which seems to be so prevalent right now, and you have in your book one thing that I, Im impressed me. Um, drug treatment attends to the symptom, but not to the human being who has the symptoms. That's true. And of course, I, I do want to say, for those watching, that you, throughout this book, do say there are some people who have been helped Absolutely. by the drugs. It isn't a 100% thing, but Absolutely. more have not been. More have not been, and, and uh, one person I'm very close to who's a veteran, who, uh, whose family, unfortunately, who's, his, his wife is um, very tough and is not understanding. And so first he went through the hell of war, and now he's living in a situation in which the person doesn't want to listen. He has gotten more and more um, downhearted, of course, and hopeless. Um, he is, he's actually quoted in the book, in my book, as giving this whole long, very, very, very long list of drugs that he's been tried on, and he said not a single one ever helped. Um, a couple of them precipitated serious suicide attempts, and he's now just on drugs. He's getting worse and worse and worse, and when you observe him now, you can see they're damaging his brain. You ask him a question, and he, he goes like this. This is one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. So it's heartbreaking to see people's souls and brains being destroyed yeah. when all it takes, and it was the case for this person, he said, the only thing that ever helped was when somebody listened and cared. Mm -hmm. that, that's so amazing because those of us who were children in World War II and so grew up uh, knowing those veterans, and we've always heard, well, they never want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So the idea of actually, at least to my generation, of saying to a vet, tell me your story, tell me what you went through, really never crossed my mind till I read your book. Well, and, and it is something that, as you say, everyone somehow can do. Yes, right. and, and I, I, I think you should be really careful and not say, tell me your story, but you, what you say is, if you want to tell me your right. story, I will listen for as long as you want to talk. Yeah. And, that, and, and, so the, and you can say, if they say no, not right now, you can give them your phone number. Yeah. Say, any time, yeah. just give me a call. Okay. I think I want to say, first of all, that some civilians who aren't therapists oh. will say, I'm, I would be scared to listen to their story, because what if I say the wrong thing? I will just tell you there are stories in the book about therapists saying the wrong things that go so far beyond what a civilian who cares is likely to say. And so I really don't think that they should be worried. But there, chapter six in the book also has some suggested questions, some things not to say like, did you kill anybody? Um, that's the first question people usually ask vets if they ask anything at all. And of course, that's a horrible thing to ask. They say right. there is no right answer, there's no good answer. Um, but it has some suggested questions, um, a couple things to just be careful about how you handle them or what to say. And, um, and then there are a few uh, examples of kinds of um, problems or difficulties that might come up and how to handle them. But I guarantee you, as a friend, as a listener who's just meeting the person, the chances that you will do them harm are very slight. And anyway, remember, almost the only thing you will be doing is listening, but listening hard. Yeah. And we have a, we just created a fund, which you can find information about on the website. And the fund is called the Welcome Johnny and Jane Home Fund. And people can um, find out information there about the fund. Uh, you can make a tax deductible contribution, $5, anything will help. And what that money will be used for is because this is a national project and we want individuals and groups all over the country to start this kind of program. And so whether you, you need somebody to do a little, a little paper shuffling or um, help round up volunteers or find places to do the interviews, um, we will be providing small grants. But it, it doesn't have to cost so anything at all. So how would you, if you don't happen to know a friend who has been serving, mm -hmm. where, 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 how would a person go about doing this? Okay, great question. Um, there is almost definitely one in your neighborhood. 
Um, so ask around. You could ask um, clergy. You could go to yeah. any of the veterans associations, whether it's the Veterans of Foreign Wars, the American Legion, whether it's Veterans for Peace. I mean, there's a, there's a veterans organization for just about everything. And out here in the desert, there's something Bill Young is one of the heads of, and it's, it's an all-volunteer umbrella organization. It's called VEAP, Veterans Easy Access Program. And they just coordinate 90, 90 organizations that either serve only vets and their families or serve them as well as other people. And they're going to have a Veterans Expo, actually, their second annual one this fall, probably October 29th. Oh, so watch for that. It'll be in Indio. But if you call them, they mm -hmm. can tell you. But just look under veterans. There are a lot of veterans organizations out here. And any one of them can put you in touch with a vet. I, I, just, I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. I sent you something that I received uh, an email, I, it's called something steel. Um, yes. Tempered steel. Tempered steel, that's and it. And it's encouraging, they're trying to get the vets to go into the schools. Yes. To educate the children yes. a little bit about war. As you say, only 1% have served, and so 99% of all Americans know nothing really about war except what they see on the screen. That's right. And, and you know, uh, there's a, a teacher in, uh, in Florida who has his third grade kids for when it's going to be Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. He has them each interview a veteran. And they ask questions that are appropriate for a third grader. But it's so important because there is a human being sitting in front of you who has served. And the next time you hear that troops were killed, I love that, troops, where's the human yeah. in there? No, a human being who has loved ones, who had hobbies, who had an entire life, is dead, right? And so the next time, any time they hear about war, it will be impossible for them to think of it as just the, the poster, you know, the, the person in their clean uniform serving their country. And while that is also true, um, however you feel about particular wars, uh, the fact is that they're not clean and they're not pretty and they're not easy. And so I think that every, everybody, I, you know, I want to say one other thing. When I was doing the interviews, the word sacred kept coming to my mind. And I'm not a religious person and I kept thinking, now why sacred? And I realized it was two things. One was the incredible honesty and courage to talk about their experiences of every vet, whether their politics were the same as mine or not, and the second thing was, by talking about what they feel and what they've seen, they're talking about the most intense experiences of life. They're right. talking about life and death. They're talking about grief. They're talking about loss of innocence. They're talking about the love of, of the people they served with and loved ones when they came home. And so that's what makes, this is sacred work that we're doing. And I guarantee that listening and connecting with a vet, it's illuminating and it's inspiring and it's moving for the listener. And you will be helping the whole country to become literate about war so that we know what's happening if our government goes to war again. You have done and are doing an extraordinary job. It isn't only in your books, but I mentioned the previous show that we did together, uh, Shades, and you've done several plays um, yes, which I, deal I, with the same subject. You're, you are passionate about it. <laughs> I am. Did your father's experience in the service uh, lead you not only into this, but into becoming a psychologist? Oh, that's such an interesting question. I have to say I don't know. I've never <laughs> thought about that. I, I knew that I mean, in my family, both my parents had a, had a real sense of the importance of, of serving in some way. And um, my, my father was the, the kindest, most generous person to everyone. He was so gentle. And um, my mother and her family, um, they were like, my mother was, was on the Human Rights Commission in our hometown, and so was her brother. And, and the, the whole ethos in the family was, um, you, when you see needs, then you're supposed to do something about that. And I'm Jewish, and so it was part of, part of that too, um, as well. So it was. I heard that at, I heard that at at, uh, at Temple. 
Um, but um, the the plays, um, I, I want to say something about Shades. Shades is, I've written three plays about war and veterans. Um, Shades is the one full-length play, and my father is a character in that play. A friend had um, made a videotape of him some years ago talking about his war experiences, and there, uh, I was watching the tape, and what, what gave rise to that play was that as I was watching the tape, I had to keep turning it off because I was crying. Mm. And the thing that started it was he mentioned something I'd heard him say all my life, but he said it so matter-of-factly. At one point, he was a forward observer. This time, boy, again, it's hard to talk about what that meant, that he was a forward observer. He was out there in front alone. And the, and the picture of my father, my dear father, uh, in a situation of that extreme vulnerability, I, I just had to turn it off. And so I was listening to stories I had heard, but in a way that I'd never heard before. It's very interesting. So in the play, the yeah. character who's called Jerry, after my right. father, um, is, is being taped by the archivist. And, um, and his, his monologues to the camera in the play um, are taken verbatim from what my father said. Oh, that's that interesting. Because I, I knew when I saw the play, I, I, I knew that your father had been in the service, and so that it had something, you know, that he was represented in the play. But I didn't realize you actually took that dialogue right from what he recorded. Yes, that's, that's right. That's fascinating. And also the line about uh, about you, uh, G. Dad says the son. Uh, you, uh, he said the son says I, I'm shy, but uh, when you're in the checkout line at Walmart, by the time you get to the front, you know everybody's life history, <laughs> and that's what he was like too. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting. Mm. Yeah. Well, okay. You who are watching can help, and yes. remember remember this show and remember what Paula said. And again, the book is When Johnny and Jane Come Marching Home. There it is. And as I said earlier, on the earlier show, it's not easy reading, but you'll get quite an education into what our veterans are going through. And I know we all know they're going through a lot. We all know that not enough is being done, but we don't know the particular cases, and you have talked to so many veterans. And if people want to do this and they have any concerns or any hesitations, you can write to me directly. If you go to my website, there's a right. contact, okay. and, and I will write you back. I'll bet you get some people. Uh, I hope yes. so. Yeah, I, hope I really so do. And um, it's, it's quite amazing. It's been fun knowing you and your family. I knew your father. <laughs> yes. I, I knew your mother. You. <laughs> yes. And here you are. Oh, yes, I mean, we all love you. You just used to come sometimes. <laughs> I interviewed you a long time ago yes. on a book that you wrote about mothers. That's right. And you've done That's 10 right. books. Well, actually, they made a mistake. This is the 12th. Oh, boy. <laughs> so okay. It says in here. Count, it said here eight, and then yes. you had the two yeah. others. So. Yeah. All right. I, I uh, Thank you so much for doing this. And I, you know, I hope that people out here will um, want to start doing this either individually or to get together in groups. You can, if you go and interview your vets and then yeah. get together and talk about what it was like for you, what you learned, and help educate other people. You know, talk to other people about what you're learning from the vets. And people talk a lot about support the troops and, yeah, vets get a hard time and, and they don't get what they deserve. And that's true, but you can do something. You, you don't. Well, that's just, that's taking it right out of, you know, do something. Yes. Don't just talk about it. That's right. They need a better GI Bill, like one like they had after World War II. They, they don't have do. anything like enough housing or education or, or help with health or with family. Well, there family. was one man that's in your book, and I think he received 20% of whatever they paid him Disability, in the service, yes. and there was so much wrong with him yes. physically. I mean, it wasn't just a little thing. He finally got it up, but it was a struggle. Well, the experiences people have had in the VA system are just horrible, whether they have um, physical injuries or whether they're, they're anguished. And, um, and I, I have to tell you that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in the United States just issued a decision saying the VA 
has to have a complete overhaul of their mental health services because the waits are interminable and because the service is just, it's not helping, no. not very much. Okay, I want to thank you again. Thank and remember, you. you too can help. And don't forget that you can tell your friends to watch this program at any time, any day, on your local Time Warner On Demand channel. And if you missed the first show that leads up to this show, that is also now On Demand. And you can follow me personally uh, and get notification of my TV shows on my website, www.gloriagreer.com, and Google, facebook.com slash Gloria Greer PS. So uh, do that, and we'll stay in touch, and we'll see you here next time.